with the Beatitudes, uh, we're going to be reading verse 2, verse 9. So all those who are able and can, if you'll stand in honor and reverence of the Word of God this morning. Chapter 5, verse 1 of the Gospel of Matthew. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. When he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You can be saved. Thank you. Jamie, when I, after I pray, if you'll play that. Father, thank you again today for the privilege, the opportunity, and Lord, the obligation today to read the Word of God in the presence and the hearing of your people. And Lord, I pray, Lord, the, this morning that you would help me to take the thoughts, pin down through the... May I present them in a way, in a fashion, that will be pleasing to you today, God. May you get the glory and the honor and the praise. Lord, I pray truly that I might decrease it, you might increase. Lord, you'd start the song said, my bones in my place. God, may we have life today uh, that's the word of God. Speak to that one today that's not a Christian, Lord. Help them to realize their need of Jesus Christ. Speak to that one that's cold and drawn back, Father, in their relationship and fellowship uh, with the Lord Jesus and the church, God. Whatever you need, Father, I pray right now, you do it, Lord, in the fashion manner you be pleased with. In Christ's name, amen. Just a little clip, if you will. Are you kidding me? God, I'm not apologizing. He's got milkshake. Have a milkshake to the car with me. Wow. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. That pretty much depicts culture, doesn't it? Uh, blessed or blessed. The word, Greek word makarios, which meant everything we have. He's given us everything we have uh, to be happily, f live happily fulfilled lives in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Is he inter These beatitudes are sort of like a stepping stone. They begin to move toward the other. And really what he's dealing with here in this verse is the comparison between peaceful relationships versus disposable relationships. In other words, the thought pattern of this particular setting is this. I will do all I can to have a relationship and friendship with others versus uh, if I cease to benefit from this relationship, oh well, no one on my back, I'll just go to the extreme. And that's exactly what we saw in the video. You see, we can we 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 create and we invent amazing things, don't we? Uh, we microwaves. We've got missiles. We've got nuclear energy. We have solar cars. Uh, we have wireless devices uh, by the Bukus. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we live in a world that cannot produce. We live in a world today that, that is just at war. People at war with one another. And, and we can't produce peace. There's a peace that can only come through a relationship and a fellowship with Jesus Christ. Uh, and just this past Friday or two weeks ago on Friday, I mentioned in a preceding message, our military has just issued an airstrike in retaliation to their killing of several U.S. military soldiers in Congress. Uh, understanding that, we 
all around us, there's a desire for peace of some. Well, let's look at this thing of peace this morning. The peacemaker. First of all, we see that. I want to look at the peace of peace. Uh, first of all, I didn't put this in on the screen this morning, but listen, uh, point one I want to make this morning about this thing of the attributes of peace is this. Peace is a right relationship with God that leads to a right relationship with self and guides us in a right relationship with other people. Now, peace in the scripture is defined really basically with two words. We find the word shalom that many of us are familiar with. Shalom means something good, something wonderful is happening in this relationship. Something is happening in this situation that is good. The word shalom. Or some use it as a departing term, uh, hoping that things go well with you as you depart uh, in the presence of one another, and they wish you shalom. And then we find there's another word, the Greek word, uh, arene. Actually, we get our word irene, and it just literally means peace, okay? It means a, a satisfaction, an overwhelming spirit, peace, uh, cooperation, we might say. I don't know what Romans Paul said in verse 18, he said, if it be possible, I underline that, <laughs> if it be possible, as much as life in you, live with all men. It ought to be our intent, our, in our desire to live peaceably with everybody that we can. That's scripture. I'm reminded of what uh, old Dr. R.G. Lee said. R.G. Lee uh, said, every person, I quote, has those who do not love him, and one of these days somebody's going to, he said, that, cat, that preacher has the audacity to say, here, he didn't have an enemy in the world. He said, I pray God to give me the courage to kick the lid off of that coffin, raise up and say, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. Well, the bottom line is, that, that's true. For, is Jesus speaking about this? Uh, peace is not appeasement, nor is it the absence of war. Uh, or, nor is it always truce making uh, the only way to have peace bottom line is to have righteousness uh, he's talking about first of all there has to be peace with God before you can have peace with others there has to be peace to have righteousness bottom line is you think about the, what I've d spoken of thus far when speaks of this thing a bit of peacemaker uh, I just say all those who live godly in Christ Jesus they're going to have enemies. If you live for the Lord and you stand for God and you stand for this book and the teachings it has, you're going to have to face it. Jesus had enemies. Jesus tried to make people good, but everywhere he went, there was the Pharisees, there was the Sadducees, there were the scribes, there were the hypocrites, there was those that chose They ridiculed everything he taught. They tried to trap him. They tried to belittle him. They tried to do everything they could people to deny that he was the son of God. Let's read, as you read the scriptures, all, all who stand for God, you're going to have enemies. The scripture says all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall for persecution. Uh, let me just go. The very first thing any preacher has to learn is that everybody's not going to like you. It doesn't take long, boy, when you go to a new church particularly. Everybody loves you to death for about, in that honeymoon period. I mean, it's it's like you're Jesus. And I've been doing this thing long enough to know, honey, it's like you walk on water. You realize who he is and who she is, and you realize who really tries to rule the roost. And all of a sudden, you've got a conflict of interest. You're trying to go one way for God, and you've got a little click over here trying to run the ship, and you can't do that. God raises up a leader to lead a church and to take them in the direction God wants them to go. And the sooner you can get away with the, with the power struggles of the church, the better off you are. I don't know where that come from. That wasn't in my notes. But anyhow, you... But folks, all those who stand for God are going to have enemies. You're going to have... I'm going to have enemies. You're going to have enemies. You shouldn't go to the work saying, listen, I'm going to... Her. Him to be my enemy. You, you don't... That's not... Okay, that's not the mindset. We ought to have to be as peaceable as we know how. But sometimes, no matter how extent you go of being Christ-like, there's just some people you're not going to be able to make peace with. It's this acceptable part of life. Jesus didn't, and you're not either. So as we see this thing of peace this morning, uh, we see the 
uh, uh, first point, the attributes of peace. But secondly, we want to look at the adversaries of peace. James chapter 4 for just a moment. Okay? The adversaries of peace. Folks, the world wants peace. I want peace. You want peace. Churches want peace. We, we love to get along. We want peace, but sin is the problem. Satan loves for sin to abound. He loves to, for the church to be divided. He loves a place where there's no peace. You see, because where there's peace, there's power. Where there's peace, there's the Holy Spirit. Where there's peace, listen, there's a freedom to worship and celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. The world wants peace. The church wants peace. Everybody wants peace, but folks, sin's the problem. Sin does everything it can to hinder us from peace. So as we think about the adversaries of peace, let me give you a couple of scriptures before I get to James. Jeremiah said in chapter 8, verse 11 and 12, he says, I have healed the hurt of the people slightly, saying, peace, peace, where there is no peace. In the days of Jeremiah, the false prophets were coming, uh, and they were saying, hey, uh, there's peace, there's going to be peace, peace, peace. But he says, there's no peace. Why? Because they were toward God. Verse 12, he says, were they ashamed? committed abomination? He says, no, they were not ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. There were going to be consequences because they were claiming a false peace. There were going to be a, a catastrophic fall in that nation uh, due to their enemies because they were the false prophets were declaring peace when there really was no peace. All they wanted was their paycheck. Well, listen to James. What did James say? James says, I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation these four verses. He said, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Don't they come from the evil desires that war within you? You want what you don't have so you can scheme and kill to get it? You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and you wage war to take it away from them, uh, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy with God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Well, what's he saying? James says, listen, there are really basically three wars going on in your life and my life in this area of peace. First of all, uh, James says we're, we're at war with one another. We're at war with one another. He says, for whence cometh wars and fightings among you? We're at war with one another. We've got, we've got war today going on between churches. Uh, we, have a, we have this war uh, of, of attendance, and we have the war of uh, building bigger buildings, and we've got all types of wars. You realize today, uh, where, he says, where are these fightings coming from? Where are these brawlings taking place? He says, where are, these war, where are they coming from? Well, we're at war with one another, folks. Dr. Adrian Rogers, in one of his commentaries, wrote this. He said, only 8% of the time since the beginning of recorded history has the world been entirely at peace. In over 3,500 years, only 286 have been warless. 8,000 treaties have been broken in that time. Since November the 11th, 1918, for every year of war, there has been two minutes of peace. Our world loves peace, a war. Our world, mankind loves war. Uh, and we're at war with one another. And we have to make sure we do everything we can to live at peace with one another. Secondly, James says we're not only at war with one another. He says we're at war within ourselves. He says, come they not hence, even, your, even of your lust that war in your members. Notice he says, among you and then in your. We're at war within ourselves. You see, folks, when peace, people aren't at peace with themselves, they aren't going to be at peace with one another. And that's what James is saying. James says, as long as you, as Bible-believing Christians, and you as the body of Christ, he's talking to Jewish brethren here, Jewish Christians. And he says, listen, if there's not peace among you, don't expect, listen, if there's not peace within you with one another, he said, most of the time it's coming because there's not peace within yourselves individually. And we're not living in individual peace with God. It begins to overflow into the body of Christ. You see, as you watch that video, you know, we live in a world, folks, that's wound tight and almost ready to explode. 
You don't know when you're going to be right, riding to, to the next appointment you've got and somebody shoots through your window because you didn't you left your turn signal on or, or whatever the case may be. Road rage is all around us. Violent crime is boiling over. This, but the same people that's out uh, carrying signs crying for peace, they're, they're on, the, on the flip side of that. They're lobbying uh, for babies to be taken in the womb. <laughs> The same people who cry for peace on one extreme are the ones who murder people and they slander people with the fabrication of lies and gossip. Number three, James says, we're not only at war within ourselves, we're at war with one another. But he says in verse two through verse four there, he says we're at war with God. Look what he says. He says you want what you don't have, uh, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. <laughs> and even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what you... He says, you want only what will give you pleasure. In other words, when I want, do not honor God, it is a very dangerous place. And usually when we're, we're, we don't have peace in our heart with God and the life that we're living, that's when we start pursuing things that will try to fill that void of peace in our lives. And before long, guess what? We'll be in a mess. That's why when, we, when we're in broken relationships, we've got to be careful on the rebound that we don't jump into stuff quick because we're going to end up getting something that will bring pre peace and sort of pacify and patch our heart and we'll be in a mess before we know it. You see, folks, look what he said in verse 4. He said, you adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy with God? What's he saying? In other words, he says we can't have a relationship with God the Father in pureness. We can't live in that peaceful relationship and then cater to the world. We can't live like the world. He says when you do, you commit spiritual adultery. Friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. That doesn't mean we're not to love the world. It doesn't mean that we're not to try to reach, reach the world and love the world. But listen, when we begin to rub shoulders and we begin to participate, participate in the activities and, and the philosophies and the ideas and the religions of this world, we're committing spiritual adultery toward God. He said, I said again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Folks, God's called us to be witnesses. He's called us to be peacemakers. You see, what's he getting at? What's James saying in this matter of peace and peacemaking? There can never be peace without a full surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Until we're right with God, we'll be troublemakers and not peacemakers. Well, let's look at the acquirement of peace. How do I get it? How do I get this peace he's talking about? First of all, notice that peace has been planned by the Father. It's been planned by the Father uh, Jeremiah 28 verse 11 Jeremiah said for I know the thoughts that I think towards you saith the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end he said I know the thoughts that I think towards you it's been planned by the Father that's how we get peace we get peace from God the Father peace has been planned by the Father. His very desire is that we, we have peace with God. Paul says we're born sinners. We're born at enmity toward God. We're in opposition. We have a sinful nature. Everything we do, Paul even went to say that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. But we need to be forgiven. We need to be born again. We need a new spirit within us. That's all been planned by the Father. The very reason God sent His Son to the cross, listen, is so that we could have peace. Peace with God the Father. Secondly, peace has been provided by the Son. I've just introduced some of that. Listen to Ephesians 2, 13 and 14. Paul says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You remember where you were before you got saved, how far you were away from being what you need to be for God? You see, because of Jesus Christ, he says, you that were far off, you've made, been made close, been made near now 
Made near, near, did he say by your good looks, by your good works, by being nice? No. He says you've been made near by the blood of Christ. You've been made near by the blood of Christ through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? Because you were opposed to God. And you listen, there, you were at war with God. But listen, when you come to saving uh, grace and faith and put your trust in Jesus Christ, there was a peace treaty made. And you, you came to peace with Jesus Christ and eternity. Peace has been provided by the Son. He says, for he is our peace, in verse 14, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Exactly what I've just said. There was a wall of sin between us. But through the grace of God, Jesus overcome death, hell, and the grave, and he tore that wall down on his, on his cross. Listen, chapter 1, verse... It said, For it pleased the Father that Him should all fullness dwell, and have made peace through the of us. by Him to reconcile all things unto Him. By Him I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. See, folks, Jesus Christ is the great reconciler. The very reason He to take the sinner who's lost without God and make him a saint who's filled with the Spirit of God, filled with the Spirit of God, and do the will of God. Bottom line, he through his child us unto In other words, he paid the price. He bought us. He bought us back. Captive Satan, listen. Made that redemption so that we would be free. Peace has been provided by the Son. You know, it's amazing to me to look around. A lot of folks today are trying to find peace. They're trying to find peace in treaties, trying to find peace in relationships, trying to find peace over here, trying to find peace if they go buy a boat. Well, if I, get, if I have so much money in my 401k, I'll have peace. If I've got a good retirement plan, I'll have peace. If I've got this, I'll have peace. We've got people today promising peace all around us, folks. But the only thing is, none of those things or no one else can give you peace. They may offer peace. They may pretend to have peace, but nobody has peace but a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Bottom line. We've got people all around us. You've got friends. You've got family. I've got family. I've got friends. They don't know why they're in the mess they're in today and the last thing they do is look to Jesus. They're trying to find peace over here. They're trying to find peace over here. That's why we've got folks been married six and seven times and some of them even in our family. Uh, they're trying to find peace. Trying to find that perfect peace. You can't do it. Peace has to start in a relationship with Jesus Christ, then it flows to others. We've got it backwards. We're trying to find peace in all these attachments and all these other things, and, and we'll never find it there. You see, listen to what Adrian Rogers said once again. Powerful, powerful quote. He said, At the cross, wickedness was not appeased, wickedness was confronted. <laughs> At the cross, sin was not overlooked. It was atoned and paid for. Wow. That's the peace you and I need. We need the peace that God gives through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's already been atoned for. He paid the debt so that you could have peace with God. And by the way, if you're trying to get peace any other way, in any, uh, any other uh, thing today in your life, materially, whatever it may be, physically, you're never going to find it. You will only find it through God's Son, Jesus Christ. Why? Because that was the purpose of Jesus coming to atone and pay for our sins on a cross. Thirdly, peace has been provided by the Son, has been provided by the Father, but I don't peace has been provided by the Holy Spirit of God. I love Colossians chapter 1, verse 19, verse 20. I want to read it again. The Father, that Him, speaking of should all fullness dwell. In other words, He, he was saying, in Jesus, the Father, the fullness, all of the Godhead is in Christ. And having, in verse 20, let's put it in, made peace through the blood of His cross. 
having made. He's talking about past tense. You see, he made peace way back there 2,000 years ago. He made peace when he went to that cross. He made peace for you and I. There's no way that we could get to God except through Jesus Christ. And he said, Father, I'll be that advocate. I'll be the one that gives them peace. I love what Jesus said in John 14, 27. He said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. He says, Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. I'm glad today because of the peace of God, we don't have to fear dying. And by the way, because of the peace of God, uh, we don't have to fear sickness. We don't have to fear sorrow. Because of the peace of God today, we, by the way, we don't even have to fear living. Amen? If we're not careful, we, get, we even get too afraid to live, to live life. God didn't call us to be hermits and, and sit somewhere in a cave. He's called us, listen, He's called us to live vibrantly, uh, to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I realize COVID's put a spin on stuff. We've got to protect ourselves. And I'm not talking about careless and carefree. There's some precautions that we've had to take and we'll have to take. Different people have different health risks and different situations. But overall, if we're not careful, we've got, we got to be very careful that we don't live in fear. Why? Because we have the peace of Jesus Christ. I love what Philippians says. Philippians 4, 7 is a peace of God which passes all understanding and shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know what keeps me going? You know what keeps the believer going today in the world in which we live that's pretty much depicted like what we saw on the screen out of control, uh, just rambunctious? What keeps us going? There's a peace that passes all understanding that keeps my heart and my mind through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gives us a peace that we can't find anywhere else. No saying is, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Aren't you glad today that the world can't rob you of the peace you have with Jesus Christ? People can't rob you of the peace you have with Jesus Christ. Losing your job, having a medical situation, a financial crisis, whatever the case may be, we need to make up our minds that the world won't take our peace away that God's given us. Well, let's look lastly at the agents of peace. The agents of peace. And I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 for that verse. And we're going to go back to one word that he mentioned over the, in the book that I've just mentioned in Ephesians or Colossians. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, 18, Paul wrote this, And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now that word reconciled really means to be brought back. It means to be brought together. Okay, uh, it, it, But it also, it, you know what it's describing? It's literally describing a peace treaty. You see, Jesus Christ, through his shed blood, signed a peace treaty with God the Father. And he said, if they'll put their faith and their trust in me and receive my forgiveness, he said, they'll be reconciled. They'll be a part of the family of God. I will reconcile uh, them to myself. All things of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And notice this nice phrase. He said, and hath given to us. <laughs> Don't miss that. It's great that we've received the spirit of reconciliation. It's great that we've had experienced that peace treaty with God the Father uh, uh, due to His death on the cross, Son's death on the cross. It's great that we've experienced that, but notice the rest of the verse. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You see, there's folks around us today who do not have that peace. They don't have the peace that we've spoken of. They don't have that tranquility in that relationship and fellowship with God. They've never come to Jesus Christ. They're on the wrong side of the cross. Listen, they've never come to saving grace. And if you're here this morning, listen, you're still an enemy of God if you've never been saved. You still have your fist up and you're opposing God because he's saying, I loved you and I sent my son for you to die for you. And that while you were yet a sinner, he, I sent my son to die for you. Yet we see the world today with fists clenched toward God. He said all things of God. But as we think about you and I this morning as agents of peace, we need to understand He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, we can't save anybody. 
But he's going back to that phrase of what a peacemaker really is. A peacemaker is one who is interested in reconciliation. Not creating another war, not starting another quarrel, uh, not make it, making the thing blow up till it gets to the place where it's going to defuse. That's not a peacemaker. The peacemaker is doing everything he can as to be an agent of peace. You see, Jesus did everything he could to get along with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and all those that can, the Gentiles uh, that, that continually were at, barking at him, trying to ridicule his teaching and, and deny the miracles that he performed and, and discredit the resurrection and all those things. But you know what he did? He was interested in his ministry of reconciliation. You know what he did continually? He always took them back to what the Father said, didn't he? Think about it. He always reminded them of what he, why he was doing what he was doing. He always reminded them that he was here for one purpose, and it was the purpose of the Father. It was to bring them to the Father. You see, folks, the bottom line is this, as you think about 